joining us for our 208th Coffee and Conversation. And again, as you can see, we have a marvelous topic here uh, by someone who knows all the details of actually what was done. And also, if you notice on your chair, we included two handouts, one which includes a map of that whole area in the southeast part of Colorado, which to me will make a marvelous day or two-day trip for you if you're ever you know, anxious enough to get out and we're all getting kind of a little antsy. Uh, okay, well, do it again. <laughs> but, but anyway, before we, we get going, I'd like to highlight some of our upcoming talks because they're also are going to be fascinating. Our next one on the 14th of August uh, will be David Barrett. And David's a, a noted author and historian who's written several books in fact, several years talked to us about this same topic because he was starting his current book, which basically covers the critical decisions that were being made uh, during the last 140 days before we finally ended the war in the Pacific with dropping the atomic bombs. And he looks very closely at what was going on at the highest levels within the Allied command structure and presidential the decisions made after the Potsdam meeting uh, and what was going on within the Japanese senior circles. You know, let's face it, you know, there's a significant portion of the Japanese whatever grueling group there who wanted basically to fight to the death. Uh, and so uh, David will give a fascinating a uh, review of that. He's also going to bring copies, uh, I think softback copies of his new book. Uh, so it'd really be quite fascinating. Uh, for a different look, Mike Ebbing's going to be our speaker on the 28th of August. And this is certainly an, an interesting assignment as in communications agency during the Nixon administration. Uh, so as kind of pointed out here, uh, Mike was one of those who actually uh, managed kind of the telephone connections, their switchboard at Camp David. Uh, and they listened in on many of the talks there. And whenever President Nixon traveled internationally around, that group also went along with them to ensure that he had constant communications with our senior leadership. Uh, so that'll be quite fascinating. September 11th, as you may have seen, there are going to be quite some multiple commemorations and stuff going on in Broomfield uh, to commemorate what happened on September 11th. Well, we also are going to have a, a sp special speaker here, uh, Chaplain Andy Maverden. Uh, he's currently retired, but spent 40 years in the military, 14 on active duty, uh, 26 in the reserves as a, as a chaplain. And um, as his title points out here, 9-11 and me, the impact of the terrorist attack on my life and subsequent ministry in Afghanistan. So he had an assignment in Afghanistan uh, as a chaplain. And so that will be, a, to me, is, is kind of a chance for all of us to almost say, what, where were we when that happened? And how did that impact our lives as well? And then uh, uh, John Petacolis, John's in the back there, uh, is our uh, board vice president and a career Navy officer and pilot. And John's going to talk to us about the history of naval aviation operations off of aircraft carriers, kind of how it started, and how in heaven's name today do you orchestrate all the actions that must go on in that flight deck with hundreds of people there you know, and very powerful, av you know, planes landing and taking off. Uh, so that, that'll be, uh, I think, superb for us. So anyway, that gets us through September. Uh, and now, without further ado, uh, Teresa, please come up. slides. Okay. 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 
Okay. Okay. Well, good morning to all of you. It's a big pleasure to be here today to go through our uh, history and also the time that my father, Leo Mershon, and his uh, partner, Emil Gimeno, worked on this project. And for me, it was just a joy to have to do all of the history and stuff that we had to do to be able to get this job. And this is a special piece of Colorado history that most people don't even realize down in the south, uh, uh, eastern part of the uh, Colorado. Um, it is very dear to my heart because my father and his partner were very much historians of their own. And they had been uh, in their construction company for 35 years and they had done churches and schools and everything. When this project came up, they were just elated and couldn't hardly wait to get started. But before they could do that, we had to prove to the Historical Society that we were able to do it. And also, just to tell you ahead of time, that the Santa Fe Trail is having its 200th uh, anniversary on September 23rd to the 26th of this year. So this is a good chance for you guys to go down there and be able to see the whole area besides the fort and still get in on all of the things that are going to happen for the anniversary. Okay, now to get started the history, I'll give some history background. Here's the entranceway into Ben's Fort, which you cannot now go into with cars. Before you could but now they keep you away from it because they're trying to reserve and get the uh, grasslands back to where they were. And, you know, a lot of the lumber and everything was cut down for the fort uh, during that time. So they're trying to get the grasslands all back in order. And then the inside of the um, fort is where they would have, oh, wait a minute, wrong one. I gotta get the pointer here. This right here is where they would put the furs, bringing in the furs from the Indians and the trappers and the traders and stuff. You could only put in about 10 furs and then they would wrap them and package them and put them in storage. Now the DAR, believe it or not, Daughters of the American Revolutions are the people who actually got Ben's Fort land. Back in the 1920s, there was a farmer who owned all that land. He was a rancher, a farmer. Anyway, the daughters of the La, La Hanta Daughters of the American Revolution had just started, and they needed a project, and they decided they were gonna take on Ben's Old Fort, but they weren't incorporated yet. So the daughters had to get incorporated, before the farmer, the rancher, would even give them the property. So about in the 1920s, the farmer decided, okay, you guys got incorporated. They gave the land to the daughters of the American Revolution. So the daughters were able to take it and start right away talking to the historical society and making it a historical site. But it took years for that to come about because you know how government stuff is so slow. Okay, during the height of the fur trade, Ben's Ford established itself as one of the most uh, busiest trading posts in the United States. It was a settlement because um, when you think about it's 670 miles. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong one. There we go. Here we are, you're back this way, you're going from St. Louis, traveling this way to Bent's Old Fort, right in this area here. It's almost 700 miles from that point. So to be able to get goods from the east, it almost took them 52 days at 15 hours a day traveling, if they did that much. 
So it would take months, two and a half to three months to get their goods from St. Louis over to Ben's Old Ford. And then they wanted to go down and go to Santa Fe, straight down. And they had a, uh, uh, Saran St. Brain had the other uh, shop or store down in that area. So they wanted to bring all these furs and all the stuff from the east and uh, Europe and everything else across. And this was, that was the meeting point for Indians, for fur traders, for trappers, for anybody, settlers that were coming through. The uh, Cheyenne, the Arapaho Plain Indians and American trappers, that was a stopping point, but also U.S. Army caught on to the fort being there. And so then settlers and explorers started coming. In the, in the 1970s, my father's construction company, when they decided that they were going to go for this project, we had to prove that we could find out all of the stuff or the historical things that went on. So it took us about a year to go through books and to go through historical papers, uh, journals, and things like that. Um, let's see here. Uh, we had to go to the colleges down there and universities. We went into all their paperwork on the fort in that particular area. And, and we read books and more books constantly. And Sarah McGoughlin, she was the first woman that actually was at the fort. And she did her memoirs as she got into the fort and she put down daily stuff of what was going on at the fort. So we had to read a lot of her stuff. She came from a wagon train across from St. Louis and she was pregnant. And her husband was a lieutenant in the army and she was gonna go see him down in Santa Fe. Well, when she got to the fort, she was having a lot of trouble uh, with being pregnant and she lost the baby. So she had to stay there for a long time to recuperate. And so there was her memoirs and then there was the um, uh, Lieutenant Abair, who actually was a lieutenant and he was an archeologist, he was a scientist, he, he uh, did things for research on plants and then research on things in the environment. And this is about his story here. And he stayed there, he was sick, so he stayed there. And he wrote, but if it wasn't for him, he, what he did, what he did on his memoirs, he wrote down everything that was in the fort. He drew the fort on the back of an Indian picture that he drew himself. He drew uh, a yellow wolf who was the chief of the Cheyenne at the time. And on the back of that, he actually drew the fort itself. Now, the Santa Fe Trail, during, in the, oh, excuse me. Coming from this area here, the Ohio, St. Louis, and Overland, in this area was not part of the United States yet. So you had the United States on this one side, you had the, un you had the claim by Mexico, and then the unorganized territory. And that is about where the cutoff point was. So, People coming from this area here still had to go into this Santa Fe Trail area and the other trails that went down into New Mexico, Cimarron Trail, and then the other trails that went up north. So goods had to be completely shifted onto the Santa Fe and then downward. So that's why they decided to build in this particular area here. Now, during that time, the um, 
uh, uh, William and then uh, Charles and uh, um, Surround St. Brain, they were trying to organize enough where they could get goods that could be taken to all these different places and shift it. So they, they were making money hand over fist. Because if you sent back like a uh, fur from this area here in the unorganized area, it was about $2 for a fur. When you took it back to St. Louis, you could sell it for almost 10. So they were d more than tripling their money. So they were really making a lot of money during that time. Um, my job on the on the job on this project was the correspondence uh, with the government and the historical society, and I had to be, check with them weekly to tell them how we were doing, where we were at. I had to go down and talk to the workers and see how they were doing, and keep checking on progress. And then we had to do everything in triplicate. You know how the government is with paperwork. So everything had to be done in triplicate. Um, we did necessary things that we had to change on the plans with the architects. Uh, let's see here. We had to do modifications on a lot of things because some things just didn't fit into uh, the project itself. But yet, we had to let the archaeologist who dug up the area, give us the information on sources of, uh, of what they did and what they had that they had left behind. So we had to use all that information about where the well was, where the cistern was, where their, they even had indoor bathrooms, believe it or not. They, I mean, the Bent brothers made sure that they had luxury at this place. And it took them four years to build it. And it only took us almost two years to build it. So the difference is because of the, uh, the, modern, the modern nation of our uh, instruments and the tools that we have. But when we were building this, we had to uh, go ahead and get all the tools that were used in that period. So. We would, we had to go down to Mexico, New Mexico, and other places to get some of these tools that were do, uh, used during that period of time. This here is how the uh, archaeologists are working out there. And all we had to go by was the outside of the adobe on the ground. And so after they completely uncovered this area, then we could tell in detail. We had to take aerial, aerial views of it to see how big, how wide, and then the structure of how much of the adobe was going to be needed at that time. Because some walls were four to six feet thick of adobe on the ground. So we had to keep the original foundation, and then we had to start from scratch starting to build it up again. That's my dad is Leo Marchand, and that's Emil Gimeno. And this is kind of like the outline of the fort on just the aerial view that we had from the airplanes. And the center is where you see the center of the fort itself, the bastines on both sides there, and then the, the Arkansas River over here. And then the whole particular prairie around it. Now, all the wood that was out there and trees were actually cut down for the fort the first time. So we had to go and get a forester and have him go out and find the forest that would give us the, bet, the wood that they would have used so they had to go clear down into southern Colorado. They had to go over to Florescent area, which is a historical area itself, because Florescent 
had some of the redwood of the United States in it at one time that's petrified now. And the redwood uh, and the um, um, cottonwoods that are over there are monsters. And we had to have 800 huge trees that were, were going to be the vegas for this structure itself. We had to have 2,000 latias, which were cottonwood too, but they were pine. And they were in a certain area that we had to have 2,000 of those. So this area here was completely void of what we needed. So we had to go out and find all that uh, for that. Okay. Now during, I don't know if you've ever been down there, some of you have, the heat is tremendous. It gets up to 115, 18, 120. <coughs> and the cold is tremendous because there was days that when we were there and the snows would come in, it was this high. So we worked around the heat. We had, an, we had to have an ambulance on the job at all times. And then during the winter time, we had to make sure the men could get out. And sometimes the snowstorms were so bad that we had to go and stay at farm homes along the way because they couldn't get out back to the town again. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, William Bent was married to Al Woman, and he, she was the daughter of Gray Thunder, who was the principal um, chief of the Cheyenne. And the Cheyenne really loved the Bent brothers. If it wasn't for their camaraderie between them, this fort wouldn't have been built because they told them the Cheyenne actually told him where to build it because they were going to build it in a, in a completely different spot. And the Cheyenne said, no, no, this is where you want to build it. Because being so close to the Arkansas, flooding. So they said, no, move it over. Move it away from this area here and you should be safe. So the Cheyenne were just fantastic with the Bent Brothers because they knew they were fair traders and they would be able to get what they needed for themselves and for their tribes. There was seven different tribes around in that area and they all would put up their teepees around the fort itself. Now this is what was drawn on the back of the Indian picture. This is what we had to go by. So every detail had to be taken out of this from the Lieutenant Bear, and we had to translate it into what was actually in this uh, fort. And if, when you have time, come up here and you'll be able to see the rooms that were in the fort. There was actually 29 rooms there was about nine other rooms on the top of the fort. And if you, if you look through the list, there's the council room, trade room, dining room, cook's quarters, kitchen, William Bent's quarters, blacksmith, carpenter shop, uh, warehouses, well room, labor quarters, wagon shed, and places that they could put all of their uh, cattle and their horses and stuff in the back. On the upper levels, it was Sarah McGoughlin. She was in the corner. She had the most view. She had windows. She had everything. Uh, they had uh, trapper's quarters, hunter's quarters, clerk's billiard room, and sight brain's room. So they weren't lacking in entertainment. They had stuff going on all the time at the fort, and they were having a good time with everybody that came through. 
Uh, let's see. The people that would come through were famous mountain men, and they were James Baker, Thomas Fitzpatrick, Francis Rodolph, Uncle Dick Wooten, and then Susan uh, McLaughlin, and she was the first lady. But they had two other people there that came with them from the east. And the William uh, Bent brothers had a slave group. They had a man and a woman, Dick and Charlotte Green. And they were with them the whole time that they were at the fort. And Charlotte was the cook for the main place. And Dick helped out the Bent brothers in any way that he could. But they were with them the whole time they came from the east and they settled there. There were seven different languages spoken at the, at the uh, uh, fort. So you had the Indian languages, you had French, you had English, you had Spanish. You had people from all over the world were coming to go through to the west. <clears throat> Uh, in uh, the site itself was dedicated in 1960. It took that long to get everything set up after the DAR got it. So it took almost another 50 years to get everything where it should be to be a historical site. And then the, um, the reconstruction of the uh, fort itself, it took till uh, it was, it was uh, being uh, sent and, and posted in different parts of the country that they could go west and be able to go there and have a good time before they went on uh, to their destination in other areas of the United States. Okay. Now, let's see here. Um, we had to do everything according to historical accuracy. So, we got the word down from the historical society, you must have this, 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 and this included. But behind all of this had to be updated versions of everything now that we have in our homes. We had to have electricity, we had to have uh, uh, water, we had to have plumbing, we had to have everything behind the scenes as we were building this. Now with the adobe, the adobe bricks, we had to have a formula. So we had to go to the colleges, take the adobe that we knew, and it had to be, what, what was the mixture? It was clay, it was sand, it was water. But to be able to withstand the weather and not fall down after a year, we had to put in 6% concrete. So all of that had to be measured and put into these huge pits that were 20 by 40 on the ground. We had to mix all this mixture with the big bulldozers, get it all up to par, be tested, and then we had to have an adobe maker. So my dad and Emil went ahead and they made an adobe machine. Because we had to have 180,000 bricks. <laughs> <clears throat> now the, uh -huh. <laughs> so to be able to do that, we had to make it in um, tons of amounts at one time. So the prairie, we used the whole prairie with this adobe making machine. And it had a hopper, it had the mixture, and then it had a front to it with all the openings for the adobe bricks. And as the machine would go along, the hopper would just lay it into the bricks. It'll be on the movie when we get to the movie here. Then. Every piece of uh, material, like the ovens, there was not one oven the same in the whole place. There was not one staircase the same. They were all different. And 
the windows had to, we had to use mica back then because you could not have glass. It wouldn't have made it through the prairies without breaking. So mica, we got the mica from Flora, Florence, Colorado, and we had to break it down, and they come in huge sheets. They had to be peeled in layers and then cut to the window forms. And that kept out the rain, it kept out the snow, but it made it cool in the win uh, summer and uh, warm in the winter. Then here, all of these hinges, the blacksmith, they did over 200 different types of hinges. Uh, they had candles up on the walls. They had things for the kitchen and everything. So all of that had to be made with the blacksmith. And then that's the center there for the crushing of the uh, uh, furs. And they would wrap them up and put them in the storage room. <clears throat> and remember on all this wood and latias, they had to be dried. So we had to use three to eight months to dry all this wood. So all this stuff had to be done and cut and dried before we, we could even get started on the building. Okay, and there's some of the fireplaces in the back, the cookers and the hinges, you can see, and the men hanging doors. Carpenters had to make everything from scratch in the, in the whole place too. Uh, let's see, the shell, okay, this here is the square nails. We had to order from Pennsylvania be able to have enough. We had over 8,000 nails, our first delivery, just to get started. And remember, the historical part of, of the United States, it was an ocean in that section at one time. So the uh, people who were doing all of the chimneys and stuff, and they were stonemasons were chipping away to do the uh, chimneys and things. Every time they got started, they were chipping away and they thought they had a chimney done and all of a sudden it would break apart. This is what came out of it. It's an old shell from millions of years ago from that, that ocean. And these are doorways here that had doors in them that weighed, they all weighed over 600 pounds for one side of the door and the other side that the carpenters would make. And these are just some of the structures that we were making. There's the window with the mica in it and the window frames. And then this is how it ended up at the end here. So it's a huge area. You have back here, you had fences and everything <laughs> for the uh, horses and cattle. But on top of all of these walls were cactuses to keep out all of the coyotes and animals that would get in there to try to kill the animals. And then this was our dedication, oops, our dedication day for uh, Bensel Fort on uh, July 4th, 1976. And we do have a, a movie here that we're gonna show on the reconstruction itself in that area. You want me to start there? Yes, that would be good. Uh, here's a chance for you to get a refill of coffee um, cookie, donut, because it's going to take a minute to transition. <laughs> okay. Are we coming back to this at all? Um, no, I don't think so at this point. I want to make sure we're on time for... Okay.
when, when you do go to the fort, they give you your own walking guide. So when you get there, you can go on your own if you're not in a tour, and you can go through each of the rooms and stuff and uh, see what they had in each room. And it's very good detail on this stuff here. Also, too, in that area, uh, there's so much more to see in that area. The maps that you guys have, you have to remember that that area is home to a lot of different other things. We have uh, down in this area in the P P uh, Picket Wire Canyon, that is where the historical art, um, dinosaur tracks are. It's the largest in the United States that you can go see all these dinosaur tracks. You walk into a certain point and you have to walk through it. Up here is the Amici camp where the Japanese Americans were held. Up here is Sand Creek Massacre. And you can see that. There's all kinds of stuff here on this map that you can do walking tours or drive to and see other things that are in that same area. Is that it? Yeah. Um, did you go down to, we come to build? Okay, go down to additional features. One down. And they came to build. Okay. We'll wait for everybody to come back. I know. <laughs> and it's all. That is. Yeah, cactuses. They used everything yeah. from the prairie yeah. for all their stuff. Okay, is everybody here? Okay, no, good. Okay. Archaeological digs during the 1960s 
under the supervision of Jackson Moore, yielded architectural and building information, as well as cultural remains, which hinted at the nature and quality of life at the fort. Where evidence conflicted on detailed points of the fort's design, clarification was sought by examination of existing adobe structures in the southwest, which date back to the 1830s and 40s. Through all this extensive research, information was constantly sifted and distilled into a final architectural concept. Care was given to every detail. Scale drawings were produced, as were freely drawn sketches of segments of the fort's design. Years of study, research, and planning now yielded to the architect's pen, and the idea was given shape.
is traditionally laid directly upon the ground. Erosion by rain splash and seepage of groundwater would have soon undermined the basic structure. To retard this action, a concrete foundation was used throughout the fort. The floors, a multi-layer design, conceived to prevent moisture damage, consisted of foam, sand, reinforced concrete, and a radiant heating system.
ponderosa of pine were treated in a similar fashion. Bark was removed by draw knives from 212,000 linear feet of pole, and then the poles were stacked, TP fashion, to dry in the sun. Placed over the beakers at right angles, the poles known as the tiers formed the roof and the framing upon which the second floor was constructed. Hinges, latches, and lanterns. 
several hundred items were handmade for the reconstruction.
Okay. Uh, any questions for Trace? Yes. The, the uh, years act, the years the Portland Act, 1845 ish on to when? Uh, 1833, they started building it, but they were there even doing their trapping and their trading while they were building it. So it was 1833 to 1849. And at the 1849 is when uh, William Bent blew up the fort because he was so upset, we think, there isn't an exact why he blew it, but it was, there was cholera, there was diseases being brought, but on the other hand too, there was the U.S. Army wanting to make the fort into an army fort. And he was very upset that he did not want the fort to be used as an army area to go after his Indian friends. So there is conflict on why he blew it up, and we'll, we'll never know. But at that time, about when the cholera and uh, smallpox and all that came to that area, it wiped out more than half of the Indian tribe. And so that was another thing. So we're, in all books, it'll tell you, they're not sure why he did it, but he was, he was very upset with the U.S. Army at that time because not too long before he blew it up, there was the Sand Creek Massacre that happened. So there's, there's all kinds of things that we're not sure of why he did it. Teresa, okay. in, the, in the archival records, was there any indication of being a cemetery? You know, or, nearby the fort that might have been also excavated? Uh, yes, there is. There is a cemetery. It is on, as you walk in, they even have a small cemetery on the road uh, coming in. But there was one that was further away from the fort because there was a, a lot of people who had been, you know, who had died along the way and they were burying people. But it was towards more or less towards the uh, southeast of the fort itself. But uh, you don't have, you know, they don't have it blocked off. They don't have a certain area saying this is a cemetery or anything like that. But there is a small one as you're walking up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When was it officially made a National Historic Site and how was it financed? Uh, in 1960. That was when it was officially uh, a National Historic Site. And then that's when the government uh, gave altercations for money to start being used and put into a pot to bring it back to life again. Mm -hmm. There is, I think, a fence new fort that is part of the east. Yes, there is. What is the relationship? The after bent. Uh, William Bent blew that up. They went down the road to Big Timbers area and he decided to build another fort on his own and he and Charles, but then Charles decided he was going to become the first governor of uh, New Mexico. So William was on his own. So William said, okay, I'm gonna build a fort, but it was nothing like the old one. Nothing at all, but it didn't last that long because he m more or less decided because most of his Indian friends were dying and they were moving out of the area and stuff that he decided, you know, I'm only going to be here just for trapping now and that's it. So it didn't get the recognition as the old one did because it wasn't as big. And the runes are not even hardly there anymore for the uh, new fort. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I went uh, a couple of years ago. I was telling you about, about the trip I went on. Uh huh. And uh, uh, part of it was going to uh, Ben's new fort. And <gasps> it's, just, it's just an outline. Mm hmm. Uh, that's, that's about all. That's all it is. There's nothing, nothing left of it. I know, it's it actually, sad. It actually looks looks down over uh, over Big Timbers, which is where Fort Wise was. Mm -hmm. 
and that's and that's where, if I remember right, that's where the the, uh, the uh, uh, soldiers for the Sand Creek Massacre uh, took off out of. Yeah. So. During that time that the um, the fort was being utilized all the time, that uh, Colonel uh, Kearney would also come through, and they were doing the Mexican uh, war down there, and they were leaving from Denso Fort to go down to take over Mexico. So there's, well, there was a lot of military things going on in that area at that time. But all the Bent brothers wanted to do is just make money and trap and leave me alone type thing. And they, the government wasn't going to let them do that. So I, they were getting discouraged about that. But then St. Vrain himself, he went down to Santa Fe and continued his, his shop that he had down in Santa Fe. So they all went their own way after 1949. Mm -hmm. If you were to read one book about Ben's Fort, which one would you recommend? Well, if you want to know the reconstruction, this is the reconstruction book. This is my dad's partner book that he put together. My dad passed away a year after the fort was built, but Emil was able to do an actual book on the reconstruction. Now, if you want to know the history of Bent's Fort, this book here, Lavender's book, and uh, a lot of the stuff in here from uh, the Santa Fe Trail, with uh, Sarah McLaughlin. That has a lot of description in it, too. And there are a lot of other books that I didn't have. But here's one on Colorado forts. And this has a, a good area about the fort. But you know, every time I pick up a book anymore about the Old West, there is something in there on Ben's <coughs> Fort. Because that was the area where a lot of people ended up at going out into other areas of the United States in the West. So these are good books. This is the life of George Bent, which is the son of William. And he actually was at the Sand Creek Massacre. And he was so disillusioned at that time with the army that he stayed and lived with the Indians thereafter. And even William did. William actually lived more than half of his life with the Indians. Even though he had the fort, he would go off and stay in the teepees with his wife and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it was the uh, atmosphere of I'm doing what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to do it, even though he had the fort, but he would go with the Indians because he loved the way their life was. And so it was, it's, it's a very heart, disheartening story in some ways because they started out with great expectations and they ended up having a lot of things falter after uh, you know, the, the diseases came and then the massacre and everything else. <clears throat> but the fort itself, if you can get down there to see it, there it makes you just want to sit there and daydream and take your sweet time. I think the last time we were there, we were there almost four or five hours. And it just is fun just to go and look at it at the prairie. And it's quiet. It's, you know, and everything about it in that area is slow moving. And the economy, when we first went down there, the economy was you know, mediocre in that area. But as soon as we started the fort, we hired tons of people from La Honta itself. And they were so excited, my gosh, their economy rose and stuff. And uh, even our, our main carpenter, Telio Romero, uh, at the church, he made, he uh, did carvings for the church and stuff. So <clears throat> people got to know a lot of the workers that were at the fort. And we had 120 men and 40 women. And the women did all the scraping of the latias and stuff. 
And then, you know, we had them in all different jobs and stuff, but they, we had expertise, I mean, from third generation people building this. So to me, it was a, it was a golden thing for us for a lifetime. And that's why I think everybody in, in, the, you know, in Colorado, we got it right here. And why not go down and see this area and see what a beautiful place? Because this is the biggest adobe uh, fort in the United States is right here in Colorado. And it's been in four different movies already. So, yeah. Is there anybody else? And, and, and it's only like three hours away. Yeah, <clears throat> you go down, you go down to Pueblo, you go to Highway 50, go east, and then you're going to go into La Janta, and it's just six miles right out of La Janta, and it's not that far. Mm -hmm. Beautiful country, Captain. Oh, yeah, it is. Last time we were there was green. Now, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Tracy, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate this. Thank you. Maybe well, it's we'll been get a you back delight. for another historical talk. Okay. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Well, please come up and visit. Um, also, uh -huh. if you haven't visited the museum recently, please do that as well. So, thank you and keep. Thank you very much.